actually commonwealth literature or new literature new literatures that we have in our uh, syllabi tells us about uh, a kind of mixture or hybridity of uh, um, literature from countries uh, which were under British rule um, for some years together and uh, you know that uh, the plight of India we were under British rule for more than 200 years and uh, this uh, kind of uh, agonized uh, suffering or agonized uh, feeling is uh, really at the backdrop of this uh, uh, commonwealth literature or uh, new literatures from around the world because you know um, Britain or European countries have ruled over uh, um, other countries most of the time and even um, America and uh, Ireland uh, um, from where uh, you have W.B. Yeats and uh, your Seamus Sidney, both Nobel laureates and uh, your Anna Burns, um, they have uh, hailed from this country Ireland um, Anna Bones, you know, she got uh, the Booker's Prize for uh, her um, novel Milkman in the year 2018, recently. And we have here, when you talk about uh, Commonwealth literature, we have here, here so many things, so many um, texts that are being associated with this uh, Commonwealth literature. Now, When you think about uh, Commonwealth literature, you should remember uh, one thing the colonization, the suffering, the kind of uh, negligence at the hands of the um, hierarchical structure of the British uh, people. Those things actually come, uh, reflect or uh, Mm, they are being reflected in the writing of the mm, uh, literature from this uh, side or from the um, people, the writers. We have uh, mm, Commonwealth uh, literature, is, they form, uh, you see on your window, on your screen, um, A C L A L S. Association of Commonwealth Literature and Language Studies actually is uh, the brainchild of Derry and Jaffers. Um, it includes uh, literature from Africa, Australia, Canada, the West Indies, the Asian Pacific region, including India, New Zealand, and uh, other Asian countries, where the Britishers or uh, colony, um, they, they were uh, colonial, they were uh, treated as colonies, and uh, the people uh, were treated as slaves by the British uh, authorities. Here, uh, after immediately after independence, we have this uh, the birth of this. Uh, Association of Commonwealth Literature and Language Studies, where they wanted to write their own version of uh, uh, literature. What is this? It is actually a kind of uh, re reinterpretation, a kind of uh, rewriting, a kind of uh, renovation. And uh, this uh, kind of uh, rewriting gave them the opportunity to represent themselves in a better way. What Britishers wrote about uh, them, because they were, they were under British rule for uh, uh, years and years together, they had some uh, perforated versions, some versions which are actually 
a kind of um, sidelining of their mainstream culture. What uh, they wrote is what uh, suited them. They didn't think about our uh, development. Actually, they think um, thought about their uh, um, business. And uh, you know about um, how Britishers came to India and um, they um, got uh, the upper hand uh, um, one by one gradually. So here we have uh, the bath of Commonwealth literature after the independence of uh, these countries, African countries, uh, Asian countries, uh, New Zealand, Australia, West Indies, these countries especially. So they formed this association of uh, Commonwealth literature and uh, for the first time and Larry Gaffer has uh, used this uh, term coined this term Commonwealth literature and uh, Norman Gaffer uh, in the University of Leeds um, addressed the um, gathering and uh, from September I will give you the details, the exact date uh, from September <coughs> 19 to 23rd uh, in the year 1963 and uh, So, with this, we have the <coughs> beginning of Commonwealth literature, and uh, after that, uh, we have uh, um, the um, scheduling of uh, Commonwealth uh, um, seminars and uh, academic uh, exchanges um, each year in uh, different Commonwealth countries. And uh, here, we have uh, some inadequacies or some um, difficulties with this uh, um, term commonwealth because uh, England <coughs> was a member but the lit literature of uh, British literature were not included in this uh, commonwealth uh, literature whereas um, South Africa and Pakistan these two countries were not uh, members of Commonwealth, but uh, their literature was included in this uh, Commonwealth literature. So it was uh, Solomon Dusri, the great novelist from India, and um, he, for the past time, um, showed us the vulnerabilities or the weakness or the inadequacy of this uh, talk, Commonwealth. That's why she, he said that common, um, the term Commonwealth is not sufficient or not uh, enough to um, describe everything that we have. And uh, we have uh, Another thing, did, um, the countries, Ireland and America, who were also colonies of uh, this uh, European colonies at some, some times in the history of their uh, civilization, they also suffered and uh, they didn't, they were not included in uh, this Commonwealth Literature uh, <coughs> Forum or Association because uh, <coughs> Ireland and uh, America was, um, they were, uh, they got independence before um, this uh, association of the Commonwealth uh, form that are the independence of these countries, uh, Commonwealth countries. But in a sense, W.B. Yates uh, and uh, his team uh, the novelist uh, James Joyce and the dramatist uh, James Sheen 
which you see um, in your uh, um, screen, I'm enlarging it a bit so that you can see it uh, clearly. And uh, they talked about uh, Irishness, uh, the Irishness experience uh, in history, culture, religion, mythology, politics, and uh, peasantry. And uh, it became the secret strength of uh, um, these uh, poets and uh, dramatists and novelists where um, they discussed uh, their Irishness, Irish identity, which was uh, not uh, approved by um, British uh, people uh, and British, uh, do, uh, British uh, thinkers and uh, writers didn't approve of um, the uh, Irish literature as mainstream literature. Similarly, some people uh, didn't approve of even American, American literature. And that is a very problematic thing. So um, they were biased towards the British literature and uh, they didn't um, recognize these two literatures, Irish literature and um, American literature, which uh, were actually on a par with uh, British literature. We know it. Uh, already. So here is a kind of um, biased feeling uh, um, by the British uh, thinkers and writers. They didn't uh, want to give uh, the due these uh, um, literatures of these two countries actually deserve. So when we come to uh, Commonwealth literature, Similarly, the fate, they didn't uh, say uh, that uh, these literatures are on a par with our literature. They say that uh, they are uh, quite inferior. And uh, that becomes a kind of uh, shock or uh, say after shock of the um, um, independence, uh, independence um, experience for all. So here we have a kind of uh, feeling which we um, uh, must uh, um, reflect in our literature so that they will know about the capacity of uh, or about the ability of um, the new literature or uh, world literature in English uh, um, different from British literature. And that is why we have uh, African literature here, uh, we have uh, Australian literature, we have uh, literature from New Zealand, um, literature from Caribbean or West Indies, literature from uh, um, Asian continent, uh, weathered under this uh, umbrella top, Commonwealth literature. Commonwealth literature can be an umbrella top or a one term um, referring to uh, literature from different countries with this uh, day because of all were under British rule for some time. So here we come to know about a kind of feeling that uh, a kind of heart uh, uh, or, a, or a kind of uh, thing um, which is internalized or uh, the experience was in war and um, that is why this experience, inward experience or experience from within helped us to represent uh, our literature, our culture, our history, our heritage in a better way and uh, were totally different from um, British uh, thinking and uh, British ideology. So this helped us uh, to represent our uh, way, our literature in a um, in, in, in an independent way, our identity, identity was uh, um, just uh, justified before uh, the British people and uh, they had to just appreciate our uh, feeling and, and uh, we have uh, a kind of independence not only 
in the political independence and not only the economic independence at least we have attained a kind of intellectual independence that is an important thing because when you become intelligent when you become uh, when you are an intellectual you are not going to be convinced by the kind of feeling uh, by the kind of message uh, which is uh, an artificial one which is uh, not uh, actually true to its terms so here i'll try to uh, give you some um, thing which is, which, which uh, spoke of uh, the independence of these uh, countries and uh, how they represented uh, their own literature culture history heritage in a in an independent way to represent themselves uh, uniquely that uh, i'll give you something and uh, here is i'll now i I'll, i'll try to uh, draw your attention to this uh, slide uh, which tells us about uh, uh, shakespeare's historical plays and uh, which express uh, a kind of elizabethan jingoism how um, british literature is uh, important how british literature, uh, literature is superior to all other literatures that is uh, the theme here and that's why um, even a writers of uh, uh, shakespeare stage has this problem and uh, we uh, um, have uh, shakespeare and um, his, his historical plays and even a, a, a great poet like wordsworth uh says that we who speak the tongue shakespeare spoke and milton right we are in everything the earth past so this is a kind of uh, narrow and uh, parochial uh, feeling parochial statement by a poet uh, of wordsworth's statue um <clears throat> without admitting the universality of literature he speaks about uh, english literature and everything that the world has produced uh, belongs to english literature that was his feeling was what's feeling and it tells us about uh, a kind of narrow mindedness and uh, this narrow mindedness will prove um Uh, prove as a um, bane of a con- um, personality like Wordsworth. Now I will skip to the uh, second uh, um, <coughs> category of slides, where we have uh, um, the importance of Commonwealth literature and how um, it uh, actually refutes the kind of. Um, um, kind of arrogance of um, the British people and how our Commonwealth literature, literature from, literature from Africa, India, uh, Asian countries or uh, say West Indies, uh, Australia, New Zealand is uh, if not better at least on a par with British literature and uh, <coughs> we um, will give you uh the how um what is the importance of uh, commonwealth literature placing it uh, side by side with uh, um british literature now even uh, just concentrate on uh, this slide the first one here is uh, uh, sydney smith who uh, says that um um american literature is uh, not at all important and uh, sydney sydney smith, uh, smith says who in the four corners of the world quote on quote reads an american book even great men of letters macule without a second thought uh, commented that indian science uh, history literature philosophy uh, 
law could be happily accommodated on a small sing single cell. So you look at uh, this kind of uh, mm, feeling or this kind of experience and this kind of saying by even uh, great philosophers, great writers from uh, England or from Britain. What they say is whatever, um, mm, whatever British literature has, those things are great and all other things that the world um, produces or has ever produced is uh, far, far inferior to British literature. So this is a kind of narrow feeling to my mind. It has speaks of a kind of narrow feeling or a narrow mentality of even uh, writers of great stature or great importance. But uh, at the same time, we have Sapunia who praised our Upanishads, Indian Upanishads, as the uh, solace of my life, as they will be the solace, solace of my death. So he, here is a European scholar, European intellectual, who has praised our Upanishads as a um, solace of his life as well as his death. So here we know side by side that uh, uh, one intellectual uh, praises uh, um, our literature or our, uh, our philosophy, uh, the Gita, all the things. Later we will go to that. And uh, another uh, intellectual, European in intellectual, um, just condemns our literature like anything else. So we know that uh, um, this is a really, really a contradictory feeling and uh, a kind of ambivalence between uh, the British literature or European uh, um, thinking. So it doesn't hold good, good to either the Europeans or uh, the um commonwealth country so uh we don't uh, understand what is uh, on the real feeling but um, we should not feel deprived of our own culture and literature we should not be parents of uh, british literature whatever feeling we have whatever uh, experience we have whatever culture we have we have to upgrade our culture, our insight, our indigenousness, our inwardness, our, we have to ask our mind in order to uh, produce literature, uh, world-class literature that uh, the world should be proud of. So this is uh, the uh, main name why Commonwealth literature came into existence. Now, I'll uh, move to the next uh, slide. which uh, is again a kind of a eulogy of uh, Indian Upanishads and uh, even uh, a writer of um, Eliot sta Eliot's stage or T.S. Eliot you ma must have uh, already read about Eliot before and uh, this is the Upanishad uh, Brihadar Nayak Upanishad um, which came uh, to limelight through Eliot's use of the term Datta, uh, Daya, Tam, and uh, Mayat in his uh, poems like uh, the West, the Wasteland, and uh, Four Quartets. Okay, so he Eliot uses uh, uh, gives uh, um, allusion to the Upanishad and uh, the Gita and. Uh, uh, it is itself a kind of proof that uh, even if uh, they do not willingly accept um, the greatness of Indian literature, Indian literature is already great and some, some people have uh, accepted it. So this is a kind of uh, ambivalent feeling. And again, the Gita is the second greatest philosophical poem in the world. This is uh, the admittance of um, your T.S. Eliot, and um, we have uh, quotations from the Gita, Om Santi, 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 and other things in four quartets uh, by Eliot. 
or um, four quartets, you might have read it, or it's a very philosophical poem, poem by T.S. Eliot, which uses um, quotations from the Gita in that poem. And uh, Eliot uh, <coughs> gives a due recognition to the Gita. That's why he says uh, the Gita is the second greatest philosophical poem in the world. But one thing is clear here, even a person like Eliot, Eliot um, gave uh, much importance to a European details, European uh, um, fantastic uh, literary piece, the Divine Comedy by Dante. Uh, and uh, here, I am divine, um, according to Eliot, Divine Comedy is the first philosophical or the greatest philosophical poem in the world and the Gita is the second greatest philosophical poem in the world. But uh, to my mind, Gita is no less than um, your the Divine Comedy by Dante. So we must uh, defend our literature or our um, um, kind of cultural representation in a um, unique way so that the world will have to recognize um, the importance of, of this literature. So this is the uh, commonwealth literature for all of us. And uh, <coughs> we uh, have uh, here, um, I will draw your attention to this slide, which uh, gives us uh, fosters uh, liberal tradition um, who admit, admits defeat uh, outrightly. And uh, he is the E.M. Poster who has written a very good novel called A Passage to India. And uh, um, he says there, quote, the earth didn't uh, want it, the horses didn't want it, not now, not there. This is uh, uh, the defeat of admit admittance of the defeat at the hands of um, the colonial power or um, the colonial, um, um, colonies where um, they have uh, actually, uh, they have also a kind of independence which uh, can defeat the British hegemony or a British uh, hierarchical power here. Uh, so, E.M. Foster is uh, known as a liberal um, humanist who uh, has uh, mm, given a kind of <coughs> recognition to Indian literature. But the one thing is clear here, we must uh, uh, repeat clearly that. Uh, even Foster had some bias because uh, in that uh, novel, E.M. Um, a Passage to India, he um, didn't uh, recognize the major majoritarian philosophy of India, the Hindu philosophy. Rather, he uh, had a partisan uh, phrase for uh, Dr. Ajit, the Muslim uh, protagonist. So here we find a kind of contradiction where um, uh, which speaks about the politics of that time where um, actually the um, imperial power or imperial conscience is still there and um, uh, even if uh, even uh, if they don't uh, um, they didn't uh, um, get success to rule over us after 1947 they were instrumental in uh, uh, the in the division between uh, India and Pakistan. They wanted to divide the country and uh, divide and rule in what, the, what their policy before that, and uh, still they believed in that kind of policy. Um, that is why they were instrumental in dividing the country. And uh, some uh, Rudyard Kipling um, actually. Uh, salvaged this imperial conscience uh, as an imperialist when he gave some importance to uh, Indian uh, 
literature or Indian uh, ideology, Indian politics. So uh, this is uh, E.M. Foster's uh, revision. So side by side, we get two things here. Um, one is the mm, British feeling that they are always great. And uh, the other contradictory feeling is that we are no uh, less uh, greater than them. We are equally, um, if not uh, more than at least equally um, um, on a par with their literature, their thinking and everything. So again, we have uh, Max Muller who um, has appraised the German philosopher who has appraised the Vedas and Upanishads. Um, they said that uh, um, these uh, open, open openers are burdened with uh, the sun and uh, the sun and the yes uh, blessings and uh, um, Tagore, uh, our, our Rabindranath Tagore from India became a, a Nobel laureate because of the blessings of yes, but still we have uh, a kind of um, partisan um, feeling that is why through common literature, uh, commonwealth literature, we have uh, a, an opportunity to take uh, revenge upon um, the uprising of this British uh, hegemony or British hierarchy. Uh, now we'll uh, go to the next slide. Uh, where we have uh, Raja Rao um, in his uh, uh, novels, uh, especially Kanthapura, and um, we have this uh, uh, East West encounter, um, and uh, where Ian Foster left, uh, Raja Rao has picked up the line, and uh, um, this uh, life and uh, anti-life are shaped by culturally loaded customs. Uh, for Libby's literature matters because life matters, best thought and said. And the literature is uh, the best thought and said in the world. So we have to um, take cue from this uh, uh, small definition. So literature is the best uh, thought and said, and it is about life. And it reflects; uh, it's a mirror onto uh, life. All these uh, things we must internalize, or in order to represent our literature, so that it will be on a par with the uh, British literature. So, with this uh, um, thing, we have uh, the Commonwealth literature, and uh, Commonwealth literature came into existence because of these kind of contradictions, because of which and this kind of superiority from the British uh, people and British uh, intellectuals, uh, including many people. So we have uh, Commonwealth literature or the birth of Commonwealth literature. But as I have already told you that uh, this uh, Commonwealth, this uh, term Commonwealth, uh, it is inadequate to describe uh, uh, literature from these new countries. Uh, that is why um, we have uh, post-colonial literature after that. And uh, uh, for uh, Commonwealth literature, we have uh, and uh, an Indian and Doyen. Uh, called C.D. Narasimhaya, who is uh, a very, very prominent critic um, and uh, is very well educated. Uh, um, he is uh, very well educated in the mold of uh, British literature and um, um, he was uh, a scholar of uh, uh, F.R. Lewis, a famous critic. Actually, he was instrumental in bringing Commonwealth literature to India because um, yeah, at that time she was um, in Britain pursuing his uh, higher studies and um, um, the development of American literature and uh, 
your commonwealth literature in india owes a great deal to this man sidi narasimhaya and uh, um, that is why we find a, uh, this uh, slide uh, one man revolution so commonwealth literature in india is a one man revolution uh, it's not a, a kind of exaggeration it's actually a, a, kind, a kind of reality, a kind of truth that we must admit. Um, because this man single handedly opened uh, um, this association of Commonwealth literature in India. And um, actually, he shared this and he popularized this uh, Commonwealth literature. Um, and and uh, he, um, he was instrumental in introducing Commonwealth literature in all academic. Uh, Mm, purposes for all academic purposes, he introduced uh, uh, Commonwealth literature and uh, it was taught uh, in uh, Indian universities as a discipline um, for his uh, efforts. That's why we must uh, give uh, credit to um, this man, uh, your Sidi Narasimhaya. Then we come to um, the left out the slide uh, which i wanted to tell you i told you yesterday that uh, this is uh, matthew arnold the victorian critic and a poet for excellence he actually advocated uh, the reading of two literatures at the same time uh, the more unlike one's own the better is uh, his uh, saying or his quotation which uh, tells us about how we can um, adopt two literatures at the same time and um, we can receive the best out of the two and the bad things must be rejected um, even if it uh, happens to be your own literature you should reject the um, bad things or things that are uh, parochial or that develops uh, a kind of narrow mentality within you so um, this is uh, what he says that uh, the more unlike one's own, the better. That means we have to accept our literature, no doubt, but at the same time we have to compare it with uh, um, other literatures so that we can find uh, what is the best uh, um, out of these two or what is the best uh, within um, out of these two and we will have to accept the best and uh, reject the worst available in these uh, literatures so there comes um, the kind of feeling we have for uh, um, your um, commonwealth literature then we will come to know about uh, on the importance of commonwealth literature and here again, we will try to have uh, the um, impression of uh, Sidi Narasimhaya, who uh, quoted uh, Chinua Achibi's phrase. Um, I quote that phrase the heirloom of multitude, multiple heritage. This is uh, the small quotation I wanted to uh, tell you about, which uh, tells that. This is uh, a, an amalgamation or a mixture of uh, so many literatures, multiple heritages and multiple cultures that we find in um, Commonwealth literature. Then uh, uh, again, he in his uh, book uh, um, says the Commonwealth literature offers us possibilities for uh, an intelligent meeting um, between the East and the West. So here is a kind of liberal feeling. Um, he tells us or um, he actually uh, tries to strike out a middle course between um, Commonwealth lit uh, literature and uh, British literature. Uh, which, uh, which are on a war footing. Uh, he says that uh, there is a kind of uh, exchange. It is better 
that uh, British people exchanged their waste with the uh, people from new um, countries or new colonies or you cannot say colonies now they are in independent states and uh, um, similarly they have to receive what is the best available with uh, these um, countries new countries so um, an intelligent meeting of the east and the west so this is uh, um, your uh, Sweden Narasimha's view about Commonwealth literature and it's, it's quite a liberal and uh, acceptable one. Now, I, I will give you the feeling of uh, your um, another critic who is again a liberal um, critic and he, um, Rusdi, actually Salman Rusdi, you know about him um, already, he says, um that uh, commonwealth literature is placed below english literature and english literature uh, literature is uh, proper whereas uh, commonwealth literature is improper and uh, english literature if english literature is the center commonwealth literature or uh, the uh, literature from rest of the world is the periphery so this kind of feeling uh, again, speaks about a kind of bias or a kind of um, narrowness. And um, perhaps for this, Rusty um, became a great man because he has um, taken this insult to his heart and uh, he tries to represent. Uh, uh, his um, country or his uh, experience, his childhood, all the things through uh, literature and uh, your midnight children which is there in your course of study is again a kind of uh, representation which uh, is regarded as the Booker of Booker uh, um, Nobel because uh, he, it has already um, got a Booker Award in the year 18, 1981 and um, after that after uh, some uh, say <coughs> 25 years uh, that, or, um, up, um, like that he uh, got this award again so that is why it is uh, regarded as the Booker of Booker award uh, for Rusdi and uh, this kind of feeling that Rusdi has for Commonwealth literature or for his own country of origin, uh, actually uh, that helped him or that kind of feeling of heart that Rusty has got that helped him to represent his country in a better way. So <clears throat> here we come to know about uh, Rusty's uh, um, independent thinking and what is the status of Indian literature or um, commonwealth literature or say literature from Caribbean, literature from Australia, literature from New Zealand. Um, there is there the, with the British uh, people, how they receive uh, these uh, literatures and how, what is their feeling about these literatures. That's why Rusty um, had a point to score um with the with his uh, authorities with the with his uh, intellectuals and uh, he uh, has used this uh, english language but with his indigenous experience and uh, if, if you have already read the book uh Night's children you will see that uh, there is a kind of saying the certification of experience how uh, we have uh, this mixture, how we have this certainties of, certainty of experiences, uh, so many, that means multiple experiences, Indian um, and uh, Hindi, all the things uh, uh, figure in that novel, um, so that we have a kind of book which is totally different from uh, the British experience and um, uh, it's all, uh, it, the book is being hailed for its originality and it tells us about our uh, independence. But at the same time, it, uh, this independence is, a tot um, it is not a gift. 
from the British, but it is uh, a hard on independence. And uh, the book of Midnight's Children tells us more than more than more than anything else about this uh, hard on um, independence, which is uh, uh, um, which is based on uh, an indigenous experience, not uh, a borrowed experience. Uh, for which uh, Indian literature was uh, uh, being neglected or being condemned because it wanted to uh, imitate the British literature before uh, when uh, Rusty came with his uh, novel um, uh, Midnight Children, he altered the table and uh, he wrote in English language, uh, but he um, wrote about his own culture, his identity, his, uh, experiences, so that um, it, um, using English language, he uh, could take revenge against the British uh, um, rule or British uh, domination till now. So this is uh, the worth of um, the book, uh, Midnight's Children, and we must have this kind of feeling. We must have this kind of independence within us uh, in order to establish ourselves um, as a um, as an independent identity, um, uh, totally different from the British uh, uh, domination. And there lies our uh, Indianness. There lies our independence. There lies um, our uh, freedom of thinking. But if you go on uh, repeating or if you go on uh, um, parroting um, the British people in uh, both in uh, letter and spirit, what we will have is a kind of uh, um, um, actually a savedness. We, are, we should feel a saved of uh, ourselves if we don't uh, develop our original thinking um, simply by imitating the British people, we are doing a crime to our motherland or we are committing a crime against our motherland. And uh, this uh, kind of uh, feeling or this kind of uh, experience uh, we must carry on with us so that uh, whenever you ri uh, we write anything, whenever we read anything, we should inculcate this kind of spirit of independence, the spirit of freedom in order to be an independent uh, thinker, an independent uh, um, writer, or something like that. And uh, this uh, feeling is uh, well developed uh, in African literature or African countries where uh, they um, have represented um, this uh, term called negritude in a better way. They are not uh, um, hesitant of uh, declaring themselves as uh, black people. And uh, um, here we have this slide which tells um, about the um, use of uh, independent identity by the African people or the West Indian people who used their negritude as a literary concept or to judge the literature. They have developed this concept of negritude and uh, which uh, reveals that they are not afraid of being black. For them, black is beautiful. And uh, this blackness Mm, which uh, really um, has thrown them the head of a slave before. Uh, they wanted to prove the white race are um, wrong by using and this uh, negritude uh, as a kind of weapon. And uh, this weapon gives them originality, this weapon gives them identity, this weapon gives them the African um, uniqueness. So they are not afraid of the British uh, or the white race now. And uh, you know about 
uh, the recent uh, happening in uh, America where uh, um, George Floyd is being caged, um, is being um, suffocated by a white uh, um, police officer. And uh, um, their slogan was, take up, take your uh, knee up from our neck. So this kind of feeling as uh, that happened in America some days back, it's a recent phenomenon you almost uh, have known about it, which actually tells us about the ghost of racism, black and white, uh, and how um, we have suffered from this uh, um, complex before how our um, Mahatma Gandhi and father of nation uh, suffered that, um, suffered from this apartheid uh, um, complex in uh, um, South Africa. So it, uh, it was there from the very beginning. But uh, um, the slogan that uh, I am I'm not uh, a racist, which is very, very popular in uh, America now, um, it has been proved as a slogan of denial. The because if you say that I am not a racist, you have to accept all races together without any hesitation. But on the one hand, you say that you are uh, not a racist, but uh, on the other hand, you say or you uh, develop this uh, hate uh, concept, hate uh, ideology towards uh, the black people. And uh, what has happened recently in America is not unknown to you. And um, this kind of uh, feeling really tells us about how we can understand this kind of feeling, how we can uh, manage our strength or how we can uh, think about the kind of independence that will sustain us through troubled times. And uh, so here um, we come to uh, get some kind of idea about uh, um, our British literature, uh, sorry, British and Commonwealth literature, and how it has all the capacity or how it, it has all the ingredients to tackle with the British literature. If not more than the British literature, at least on a par with British literature. And uh, here is a um, critic, uh, Bruce King, uh, in his book, Introduction to uh, Literatures from the, of the World uh, in English, uh, he argues that the um, that many literatures are available with multiple um, literary and cultural traditions, and uh, this is common lit uh, common wealth literature for all. So we have uh, one uh, we had earlier we had uh, one British literature, but now we have. Uh, multiple literatures and cultural traditions. They offer us a kind of choice. And uh, we, last time we had seen that um, Booker Award went to uh, Canada and uh, um, your um, Africa, both jointly awarded, uh, Margaret uh, um, Atwood and uh, an, Af an African uh, mm -hmm. Novelist, they were jointly awarded this award. So, no more the British literature is uh, important now. We have established our Commonwealth literature, uh, which is uh, um, later, which is uh, known as uh, post colonial literature, uh, <coughs> has become um, the, a, a force to, the force to reckon with uh, right now because. Uh, British people have uh, actually, or British literature has actually um, facing its bane, not the good. Uh, 
at the cost of the boom literature or uh, literature of a boom um, by the commonwealth people or by the commonwealth countries. Uh, we have uh, Australian people, we have um, um, writers from New Zealand, we have writers from Ireland. Uh, you know the uh, case of Anna Bonds. Who is uh, um, who, who has been awarded this, this uh, um, book prize for his for her book Big uh, Man? And uh, here we come to know about um, the independence or uh, the independent thinking, independent identity of. Uh, um, the writers from these countries who um, have established themselves uh, as uh, um, an independent authority or independent entity uh, to the literature from religious literature. So we have literatures in English who have fought well and fought successfully against the British literature and uh, and this is literature is uh, no more superior now, if not uh, um, inferior. They, it is, uh, we can take British literature and all other literatures of this world on a par with each other. No one is inferior, no one is superior, no literature is inferior, no literature is superior. So, this is a kind of uh, uh, feeling that uh, we must develop. So that our thinking, our writing, our representation will be independent and uh, we can develop a sense of uh, independence, a sense of uh, own, own or a sense of owning literature of our life. Okay? This is about uh, commonwealth literature for all of you. Now we will go and move to the next uh, important thing that is uh, post colonial literature, which is again an absolute of this uh, commonwealth uh, literature. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, So when we talk about our uh, post-colonial literature, this is the absolute of your commonwealth literature because commonwealth literature, as I have already told you, is uh, the term commonwealth is uh, not adequate uh, in representing literature from, both, from around the world. Um, because, as I told you, that uh, literature from South Africa and Pakistan was uh, post colonial, but they were not members of this commonwealth. Similarly, England, which was a member of commonwealth literature, uh, commonwealth uh, nations, uh, literature of uh, England or British literature was not included in Commonwealth literature. So, this kind of ambivalence or this kind of uh, a contradictory feeling gave uh, um, rise to this uh, new talk, post colonial literature, which is uh, actually acceptable to all literature which uh, has been produced after uh, this uh, in, um, independence of these colonies. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, European dominance. And uh, here we have uh, inclusion. We can include uh, literature from Africa, literature from West Indies, uh, 
literature from Ireland, uh, literature uh, from Poland, uh, Asian continents, including India and uh, Australia. So all these uh, countries uh, were um, gathered under the umbrella of the Commonwealth or Commonwealth literature. It, uh, they have taken it easily shifted to the post colonial uh, bank, where we have um, no problem in uh, accommodating all the pictures that were written in English um, and um, which and the, which were the British colonists before and they got independent uh, in the 20th century. So <clears throat> when you talk about post-colonial literature, we uh, must uh, get the feeling of the literature around the world. Uh, it is not that one country is included and one country is excluded. We can have uh, literature from all uh, other nations who are excluding the British literature, European literature. And, and here we have uh, uh, the literature of the uh, colonies, post colonial literature, third world literature, third world bank writing. Uh, we have subaltern writing, which I had briefly stated uh, yesterday, and um, we have the decolonization of the mind, which, I, which the recent development. Um, and thinkers like Walter Mill, they talked about um, this decolonization of your mind and um, how you will represent your own identity, your own race, your own literature, or thinking by first of all decolonizing your mind. So let us first come to this uh, talk, post colonial, and uh, as it uh, Clear from the term post colonial, um, colonial, the experience of the writing, the culture that we have developed um, after the departure um, of the British uh, hierarchy or British rule may be regarded as the post colonial literature or post colonial writing, post colonial politics. Uh, we have uh, post-colonial economy, uh, post-colonial culture, all these things. And uh, what we find is a kind of unity in diversity. But is this unity in diversity? Uh, under this umbrella term post-colonial, we have uh, included uh, um, literature from all of the countries. That is uh, um, a significant uh, development. Um, we do not have any kind of uh, ambivalence here or uh, contradiction here because all the countries who were under British rule directly or indirectly before can uh, uh, come under this umbrella term and uh, um, voice their uh, views, voice their opinion, voice their uh, um, independence or freedom of speech. So here we get a kind of uh, um, acceptable talk or uh, a universally acceptable term like literature is universally accepted uh, is universally accepted values. Similarly, uh, this term post-colonial um, accepts uh, so many things like uh, uh, your subaltern literature, like your um, third world uh, writing, uh, like your decolonization of mind. All these things are uh, very, very important, and uh, that is why, uh, to my mind, um, post colonial, the term post colonial is more acceptable than the um, tech literature. Post colonial literature or post colonial writing is very much 
acceptable and uh, uh, we have uh, more um, um, development of post uh, progress of this uh, post colonial tech than uh, becoming the tech. Here we have um, um, theoreticians, um, the um, cultural critics like uh, uh, Edward Said and uh, Baba and you and Gayatri Spielberg. They have actually <coughs> um, told us about the importance of the post colonial writing and uh, when I talk about post-colonial writing, you, um, you should have one thing in our mind that uh, it became uh, institutionalized. It, it became an institution itself. And uh, we have established uh, so many departments all over the world about post-colonial writing. And, uh, what was the, the problem with the Commonwealth uh, literature or the Commonwealth literature departments around the world in the universities? Uh, so, so many oppositions were there uh, about this uh, department of Commonwealth literature. Um, but uh, here, we didn't have uh, any problem with post colonial writing, even we have. Uh, um, post colonial writing or African studies in America, African studies in England, and with the literature, we, we have a comparative uh, um, departments even inside other countries. Um, there is no problem for post colonial um, literature departments and establishment of departments in different and along English departments. Now, we don't have a uh, department of English, it's a department of uh, uh, a single department uh, around um, the universities around the world. We have uh, interdisciplinary studies where um, culture is there, uh, post colonial criticism, British literature, American literature, everything is included. The literature has uh, um, been. Um, since literature has not been fundamentalized uh, anymore, they are now free. Literature um, has uh, extended its uh, hand towards uh, other disciplines like history, geography, even environmental science. All these things are included uh, right now uh, in the broad uh, break literature. So here we get a kind of um, broad band acceptability um, to literature uh, which uh, began with this post colonial writing and uh, um, the empire rights way is the first uh, the theory and the practice in post colonial literatures is the first uh, major book of writing where three authors, uh, Ascot and uh, the company, they wrote uh, about, they actually edited a book uh, mm. of uh, theory about post colonial, post -colonial literature, where um, literature from Africa, Asia, uh, West Indies, uh, Canada, Australia, mm. and uh, included and uh, many thinkers um, they were invited to speak on topics of their own joy and uh, before that we have uh, cultural critics like the Herbert Said, Humuke uh, Baba and uh, other uh, great uh, um, theoreticians like your Gayatri Kapoor of Spivak, and even your movie bar, Tom Kiel, Kenya, and um, you have Walter uh, Mingyu, uh, who speaks about 
the decolonization of the mind. Uh, here we have a quarterly of critics. Uh, they have tried to popularize this in the literature. And uh, in Africa, I have forgotten one important name. Uh, he is a Kanji Phenom who uh, was regarded as, uh, who was regarded as the father of African teacher, African theory. And uh, how he had used his uh, English training to voice uh, the uh, rebellious attitude in African literature. That becomes the important talking uh, point here. And uh, In a book called uh, Black Skin and uh, White Mask, uh, which was published in the year 1952, he spoke about uh, Fanon, um, spoke about this colonial days, um, how it has been uh, defined and uh, stereotyped by the Europeans. Um, Old culture is the superior to um, the um, cultures from Africa and West um, Indies, and how um, the European thinkers or Indian European culture uh, had a upper hand um, in the culture of uh, or in derivating the culture of the post-colonial or African and uh, Caribbean countries. He speaks about that. And um, I'm putting a few, I'm putting a few lines from Lennon's book, The um, Black Skin and the White uh, Mask, for your reference. There is a fact. White men consider themselves superior to black men. There is another fact. Black men want to prove to white men at all costs the richness of their thought, the equal value of their intellect. How do we explicate us? This is just a small quotation uh, by Franz Ben. Very uh, simple, but at least uh, philosophical. Very sad that uh, there is a fact, white men consider themselves superior to black men. We know till today how racism has uh, um, taken hold of the American ideology in recent days. In the case of George Floyd, we have seen it. So, Naturally, the fact is that white men consider themselves superior to black men. Beginning from this tradition of slavery to the uh, killing of murder of God boy, we know that uh, white uh, race is always, uh, white race is always considered superior. But the, there is another fact, Canon returns. What is that? Black men want to prove to white men at all costs the richness of the thought. Now, we have seen what is happening in America. And uh, here, black men have proved more than anything else that uh, white men are not superior anymore. Black men are on a bar with the white men now. And uh, they have also their intelligence, they have also the business of thought, and uh, they are the equal value of their intellect. If not uh, superior, at least they are a bar or equally intelligent uh, 
intelligent the fighter race so this is the challenge that uh, uh can can had uh, had voice for uh, african people or the west indies people and uh, we are seeing his approach right uh, now how he has proved that uh, even today racism has uh, become uh, an issue an important issue in a country in, in an advanced country like america and uh, how in education is going on and uh, and the pandemic uh, pandemic of corona time we have this uh, racial uh, dissent and uh, this cause of racism and uh, the effects of racism and the colonialism on the black people and how to overcome or deal with the whole the effects are a concern of the trans panel and uh, parent believe that uh, to a great or lesser extent the black people had uh, internalized the racism of these uh, those who ran the society and either accepted an inferior status or failed the necessity to prove themselves fully human and equal but in the fight means now till now what point panel says till now they were under uh, the all of the white men part of white men who part white men be part uh, white men say all the things actually influenced their thought their kind of their kind of living and uh, even if they thought something even if they wrote something independent directly or indirectly explicitly or implicitly these things were being influenced by the white as in white hierarchical um, content that's why um penum thought that uh, in order to uh, see the improvement of or uh, identity of the uh, african or uh, caribbean writing or black writing what could be done is to said the fear of this white race against ghost of white race or white supremacy which is uh, there um, which had preoccupied the mind of the black man till now um has to go at any cost this was a uh, uh, penance of promise and uh, we have seen time and again that uh, african people are better than the indian people because they have proved their uh, vulnerability their weakness their negativity to a point of strength but we haven't been we have uh, not been able to um, prove ourselves uh, ourselves uh, ourselves independent and uh, till today we hesitate to think uh, uh, anything in uh, our mother tongue because uh, uh, we have uh, it is fear we are afraid of uh, being limited in our recognition if we think in uriya what will happen is uh, outside the odisha no you this is the thing that's why you uh, must get uh, translated in english or in other languages so that uh, uh, people will recognize you or your talent that fear haunts us always but uh, african writers are not like that those uh, original writers they will write in their mother tongue and you know about the chinua sb and uh, he had uh, uh his book uh, 
mas ko. Things fall apart. Um, in Hindi language, and that is that has been translated. So here in India, you have uh, had uh, such a kind of feeling where we directly want to write in English language, and uh, sometimes we have this feeling, we, we, we have this uh, uh, inferior uh, inferiority complex that comes as a stumbling block and. Uh, it, it doesn't help our cause anymore, and um, sometimes we uh, are not able to express what we think properly because uh, um, it's not easy to express everything and anything in a foreign language like English. So, African writers they wanted to use their own experience, own heritage, own history, own culture, and own kind of lifestyle uh, in literature for fusion, that is selective. We wanted to we want to select things, but they do not have this uh, feeling of selecting things. Whatever comes to uh, their free mind, they want to write about that. And uh, we put a pressure on, on our mind, on our thinking, that this should be written, this should not be written like this. But they don't have this hesitation. I have seen many um, uh, pictures and many um, short of films about African culture and about African identity, just uh, overturned by their kind of representation. And uh, sometimes I feel that uh, they are far far superior to now, even if uh, they are black. Blackness is their advantage. Black has become good to certain. That's why they represent literature as it is. They represent life as it is. They represent their culture as it is. They don't have any kind of problem. This is their strength. And uh, when you come to the Indian um, <coughs> scene, Indian literary scene, we uh, hesitate. Uh, express things um, in our own way. Sometimes uh, we are being carried away by the British description or the European descriptions. We don't have our own uh, originality, and sometimes we are being treated as hypocritical people because we tend to lie a lot. We uh, are liars. As far as uh, our representation is concerned, we try to select a person and try to describe about that. We present an edited version of what we are going to go on. Um, our experience is not uh, open. Something we um, express and something we um, omit. And that uh, becomes our problem. And, but African writing is not like that. Even Australian writing is not like that. Even uh, writers from West Indies they do uh, represent themselves in a um, edited uh, way. Whatever comes to their mind, they express that. That is their strength. And uh, say, Fanon, the Fanon is uh, the thinker, is uh, the master of uh, African writing, who has inculcated this. Uh, Feeling of independence, feeling of originality, where no African writer is afraid now to tell of him or herself or himself uh, in an open way. They don't uh, hide things. But in India, we have this problem, we have this uh, environmentality, we have this, uh, um, say, this. Uh, Inferior complex that if I if I disclose uh, the realities about myself, uh, people may disregard uh, uh, my status, my position. That uh, the fear that the haunts or that haunts or uh, every time, but not so with uh, the African people. If uh, um, the writer has seen a great scene um, directly. He has no hesitation to express that without uh, any problem and without any 
hydrated city. Hey, but uh, in, in India, we have this problem. So this is the, the power of trans feminine. This is the strength of trans feminine, uh, the um, city who has helped the African people uh, to uh, represent themselves independently, to represent themselves in a very unique way, in a very special way, uh, reflecting reality as it is. There is no such uh, identity, there is no such uh, uh, <coughs> conversing of things. Uh, in India, here we have some kind of restoration of originality. In, in recent years, we have um, novels of Jesus Pandey. We have uh, in recently, I have read um, a novel called Half the Night God by some bats. I don't remember the full name, but we have got a word recently. Uh, that novel uh, tells us about um, how. Uh, your indigenous experience can be described in a very important way to achieve an area. Our third achievement is uh, uh, a kind of dead work for him. Um, he um, has described many things, many even uh, he has described uh, the Ushdas uh, Raman, many quotations many uh, quotations are directly uh, written in Hindi, uh, in Hindi and at the same time translation in English and provided uh, so that uh, he doesn't hesitate to represent our own culture, our own Jutsas Ramayana and uh, the incidents of Mahavarats, all these things um, with, a, with an open mind. And uh, he talks about everything. He talks about life, he talks about, he talks about uh, um, the Lalas and how a Dalit uh, writer who has owned the title of the word has been treated fairly. Uh, so all these things are there. But at the same time, he represents in a better way. Um, in an independent way, what comes to his mind? And that uh, uh, is a rare scene in Indian novels. I have read so many novels. But uh, all this, there is a tendency to imitate uh, the Europeans, imitate the, um, say, um, the um, British literature or something like that. But uh, at least, if not uh, a an open limitation, at least a mixture of that. But here is a novel, uh, Half the Night in the War. Actually, that is a good example. That, that is an extract from Prince um, Das uh, Ramjan Manus. Uh, and uh, we get a feeling that uh, the writer, Bhakti, has uh, this is not your Subrata Bhakti Manus. Uh, um, say, Odisha, we have uh, perhaps Amit Bhakti or something like that. I've recently read that uh, novel and uh, I like that novel for the four reasons. The students uh, Hindi uh, in a uh, national language in a very, very informal way without. Uh, um, any same uh, sense of uh, same you know, feeling or any sense of sameness. Uh, that is uh, the strong quality of the writer I like most. If I write in Uriya, there is no hesitation. There should not be any hesitation about it. I must uh, uh, try to communicate with the reader directly. Uh, and uh, that kind of attitude is almost uh, absent. Uh, and uh, his approach is quite fixed and uh, plain, so that uh, everybody can understand it uh, without any problem. And uh, there is no, um, say, 
a tendency to complicate things for um, the reader. And that is another strong point uh, of the novel uh, of the 19th war, which is a very prestigious war in India. And uh, I like that. And that is why we should develop a kind of uh, independent thinking. And uh, that independent thinking has to represent our um, also, our identity, our history, with, uh, everything in an independent way. So that is the best thing we have uh, in uh, India. But uh, unfortunately, this is uh, a very recent development. And uh, other uh, movies are there, um, but uh, they, they represent our culture, our identity. Uh, in a very hesitant uh, way, whether they will, accept, they will be accepted or not, that, 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 is, that is an institution. So that is why um, I like that this novel, of the United God, by Amit Bhakti, uh, Bhakti uh, I have uh, I couldn't recall the name properly. Um, so, this is uh, about uh, the post colonial writing from Africa and uh, India. And uh, we have uh, uh, this filling uh, mm. up magnitude or practice, which uh, is being represented by the Africans in a better way than we Indians, because we always try. Um, try to have a kind of certification uh, of experiences with some of the masterly does in um, the novel uh, United Children. But uh, here we have uh, this problem because there is no independent identity, there is no independent uh, description. We have uh, a kind of mixture of feelings where you have a mixture of feeling, you uh, lose uh, a kind of identity, a lose, uh, lose uh, uh, your independence to some access. That is uh, not the case with Amitabh uh, Bhakti, who has written that novel of the United World from an uh, independence point of view. Uh, from the experience uh, totally Indian, we feel that uh, a, an Indian experience is uh, described free and frank. There is no hesitation describing thing. But uh, in other novels, um, which are equally important, um, I actually find a kind of um, hesitancy, a kind of, uh, say, um, sentiment on the part of the writer to describe each and everything old, racist, history and fancy, that uh, mm. is the case of Indian writing. At least to my mind, we are uh, not on a part with the African writers, though they uh, are not afraid of speaking about their blackness, their celebrity, suffering, and other things. But uh, here in India, we don't have this uh, old savior uh, um, to disclose uh, everything and anything that, happen, that has happened to us in our writing, in our representation. We hesitate to speak of uh, things in old manner. That becomes our particular skill. But uh, with the applicants, that is not the case. And Hans uh, Pannon is the instrument in uh, inculcating this habit um, in African people, African writers, African thinkers, uh, they have uh, represented themselves um, in their own language. They don't need to uh, popularize, popularize their own language. We have beautiful language, you have Yoruba culture, you have uh, other uh, oral cultures, which has uh, given in African literature. Now, we are slowly picking uh, the African cue, and um, 
threat uh, in the coming years, we'll see a kind of uh, revolution in the literature too, which had already established itself, but not the way one would like it to be, but uh, in a rather conversing way or a cover up way, we have seen Indian writing, but uh, Africans are not like that. So, here is a comparative uh, discussion of uh, African literature and uh, Indian literature, which uh, is a very essence, um, which is very uh, indispensable while uh, discussing uh, post colonial writing, because here we feel that everything uh, about the post colonial, colonial writing uh, will be open when we compare. When we have a comparative study uh, through uh, parallel uh, literatures, through parallel literatures of uh, different nations, and uh, what is important um, in each literature, in each writing, um, should be our focus. And that will give us a kind of feeling which we must accept at any cost. I hope. Uh, this should uh, hand uh, um, to this uh, deliberation and uh, whether uh, you have accepted it or whether you have uh, internalized it or not, this is the truth and this is the truth of the uh, common book literature, work the literature, say, um, your literature from far away countries, sort of a thing. And uh, if you have any doubts, we can discuss it uh, now. Uh, the discussion for today is up. Thank you. Sir, are you here? Can you hear me, sir? So do you have any doubts, students? Can you hear me? If you have any doubts, please uh, ask me. Sir, it's over to you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Thanks a lot. Well. And I appreciate your patience mm -hmm. to take the class.